Good morning. Happy Wednesday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. As always, Wednesdays, very crunched. Um, more so this week because of the, the holiday coming up. Um, had to move a bunch of stuff um, onto the Wednesday schedule. So we got we to gotta, uh, cut to the chase here. I'm going to do three highlights um, from previous videos that, that I hope that you've seen before. And this is a review. If not, you're going to love these. Um, we got one on the infrastructural angle and why it's not a number that you need to be chasing when we're talking about, about measurements and why there's no ideal. So you're going to want to watch that. Um, there's also the second one is a really common mistake that people are making when they're coaching breathing, especially with your wide ISA individuals. And then third, we've got uh, what causes a positive Hawkins Kennedy impingement test and how to clean that up. Also, a quick reminder, uh, tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Thursday, uh, we got the coffee and coaches conference call as usual. So it's a great way to sort of lead into the holiday, hang out with some coaches, drink some coffee, and we'll talk shop for as long as we can uh, tomorrow morning. So um, everybody have a great Wednesday. Um, I, will, I will probably see you later this week. Hard to say. It's just a weird week. Um, everybody have a great day, and I'll see ya. If we get to, to close to the, to the to 2020 here, there's been a couple Korean studies where they were looking at ISAs and they're trying to find a, a good way to measure it. Um, and they're trying to find sort of like some averages or some sort of weird optimal. And then um, they were trying to determine uh, inter-rater reliability, which, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> which turned out to be very, very high inter-rater reliability. So that's good for us because it gives us an, an, an opportunity to just say, okay, we're all gonna be pretty good at determining what is a wide and what is a narrow. But where do these numbers come from? So Shirley Sarman participated in a study with, with, with uh, uh, another uh, practitioner, I'm assuming, uh, named Zeller in, in 1983. Um, it, it's in a supplement from physical, the Physical Therapy Journal, which apparently doesn't exist. I can't find it anywhere. Um, but they, they talked about 83 degrees as some sort of average or optimal or something weird like that. I think the Koreans found something that was just shy of 90 degrees. And so it's, it's almost like they, they said, okay, well, you know, it's kind of like that. So let's just say 90 is, is, the, is the standard. And so a lot of people are using 90 as the standard. The, the New Zealanders are using 90 as the standard. But I think it's, I think it's a little bit of horse hockey. Um, it's kind of like just throwing a dart at a dartboard and going, oh, 90. Okay, we'll call it that. Um, because there's really no foundation for it. It doesn't really represent anything useful for us to try to chase a number and say that, that this is optimal, this is the standard, and we need to push people towards this because, again, it's just not very useful. Um, the, the one number that I've used and talked about um, is, the, is the 108 thing. And where that comes from, Zoe, is, is from two behaviors. So, so uh, Graham Scar did, did some work in 2013, and he was looking at, at, at the helical orientation of a tube. I don't think you can see this very well. So I got, I got helices drawn on a tube. And, and so the helical angle is where everything crisscrosses, right? So it looks like an ISA, and then they measure from the vertical. And what he found was that when you have an angle from the vertical at about 54.44 degrees, I have a tube that can elongate and expand in both directions equally. And so what that would be representative of somebody that would have, say, the ability to inhale and the ability to, to exhale effectively. And then we say, well, there's the optimal. But the reality is, it's like, no, that's just somebody that has that capacity when they have that kind of an angle. So chasing it is useless because um, trying, to, trying to put somebody into a standard is like trying to change somebody's height or their shoe size and say, oh, um, I'm sorry, sir, you're six foot six, you're way too tall. If we can make you six foot three, you'll feel so much better. And so we can't look at this thing as, as, as something like that. So we're not chasing an optimal, we're not chasing a standard, and we're not chasing a number. Get the numbers out of your head, except for one reason, and I'll tell you that here in just a minute. So what, what, what 
comes out of all this stuff. So all the people that came before us had bits and pieces of information that are very, very useful. But you gotta look at a whole bunch of resources and then try to bring them together. And that's kind of what I did when I constructed the wide ISA and narrow ISA archetypes is I was looking for the behavioral bias that would help me determine what the best intervention for this person is to restore some capacity of adaptability. And so what the ISA represents is one small piece of a big puzzle because what it represents is the structural element that, that this person will be biased for for life. It is a genetically determined um, uh, structural element um, that will um, tell me um, what type of muscle activity they're gonna be biased towards. It tells me what type of breathing strategy they're biased towards. It tells me uh, concentric, eccentric orientation. Are they biased towards internal and external rotation? And so that's why my archetypes are so important for me because it allows me to determine the best possible intervention that's gonna restore the adaptability. I'm not trying to chase a number. I'm not trying to push people towards something that they have no capacity to reach. I will never be an NBA basketball player. I'm not even going to try because I know I can't do it. Kind of along the same lines. Okay, so what we have is an ISA that helps us determine part of, of the structure that's going to determine the behavioral bias of this human being. But, but point being is that most of our resting breathing should be relaxed and comfortable and not require any thought. Now, when I started talking about the two archetypes, when I started talking about wide ISAs and narrow ISAs and classifying them in regards to their, their tendencies, we started to talk about using different ways of breathing to reinforce uh, a, a change, to, to get someone to the opposite end of, of this, uh, the, it appears to be this dichotomy of inhalation, exhalation, they're actually occurring at the same time. So it's not really a, a true dichotomy. But because the diaphragm does not descend uniformly in the two archetypes, it requires that there's two different types of breathing when we're trying to restore movement capability. So with the narrow ISAs, because of the way that they trap air in the thorax, if we use a high pressure strategy, all we do is reinforce the compensatory strategy. We continue to trap air and we don't make the changes that we're, we've been attempting to change. And, and so we would use a more relaxed mouth, sort of, we always describe it as like fogging up a window, fogging up a mirror type of breathing because if we can slow down the exhalation, we actually uh, provide time to clear the air that would normally get trapped during the compensatory strategy that a narrow ISA would use. With a wide ISA, we tend to use a little bit more forceful exhalation because what we have to do is we have to, we have to close, we have to close the, the, the wide ISA. And the way we do that is using superficial musculature like external oblique, which would then narrow that angle. So that actually does require a little bit more of an effortful exhalation. But here's the problem that, that people are running into, especially with the wide ISA archetypes, is that they're using high levels of muscle activity during the, the, the breathing activities and they're using a more forceful exhalation. The problem that you run into with that is, I've already got somebody that's utilizing a very, very strong exhalation, concentric orientation type of strategy, and then all you're doing is reinforcing that during the activities that you are attempting to use to restore movement capabilities. So what you end up doing is, you just reinforce the strategy because by driving the exhalation too aggressively, they recruit their superficial strategy just like they're doing under most circumstances and then you don't get the changes that you want. And so we have to take the superficial strategies into consideration whenever we're trying to coach somebody through some form of breathing activity, especially when we're trying to restore movement. Um, so under those circumstances, we actually use a very relaxed, casual type of breathing with very slow, methodical movements. Um, very, very low tension, very, very low effort. And because again, if we have this really, really strong, wide ISA, superficial, concentric orientation, you're never gonna get your way out of that by trying to, to use more effort. Because again, you just reinforce the strategy. So again, I would caution you against um, thinking that there's only a way or there's only two ways. What we have to do is we have to consider what this person that we're working with is, is bringing to us and then we have to reason our way 
through the, the, the strategies to alleviate whatever we're trying to change or reinforce what we're trying to reinforce. So from a performance standpoint, if I do have somebody that, that has to drive a lot of high force, then I do want to use a concentric strategy. I do want to use this aggressive exhalation. So always taking the individual into consideration. Okay, now I don't use these tests because my table tests will tell me exactly where these compressive strategies are. Just because somebody doesn't have pain with, with these, these positions, it doesn't mean that there's not a compressive strategy there. It just means that it's not sensitized, so everybody kind of ignores it. Um, and then when somebody does have pain, they tend to blame the poor little rotator cuff. It's not his fault. He's just the result. And so let's talk about where this compressive stuff comes from, okay? So let's go Hawkins Kennedy first. So Hawkins Kennedy is, is that, that test at about 90 degrees of shoulder flexion where they drive into rotation and, and you always get that wincy face on everybody there, okay? And so what this is, this is caused by a limitation in shoulder flexion below 90 degrees. So this is a posterior lower compression that steals the early phase of external rotation of, of arm elevation. So um, again, go to YouTube and check out my shoulder flexion video so you can actually see how to measure this thing, okay? We're also gonna end up with an anterior orientation of the thorax because for me to have that posterior lower compression, I got all the other stuff laid on top of it. So I got dorsal rostral, I got pump handle down. Um, so again, I'm dealing with a lot of compressive strategy and the anterior orientation. So I've got an early uh, loss of shoulder flexion, but because of, the, of the, the orientation, I'm gonna hit that IR early, and then I'm gonna run out of internal rotation very, very quickly. So again, I get this compressive strategy right at 90 degrees. So here's the solution. Number one, we wanna eliminate interference. So we're gonna avoid bilateral symmetrical exercises. So most of this stuff with a barbell in your hands is probably a bad idea. Anything that's considered a lat development exercise is probably a bad idea with an exception that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So that takes chin-ups and stuff like that off the table. Next step, restore the dynamic ISA. I have to have an ISA that can move so I know that I can recapture breathing excursion. We're gonna keep the activities in, in um, uh, below, rather, uh, 90 degrees of shoulder elevation. Because what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to capture that, that posterior lower expansion, but I don't wanna provoke in, any symptoms in the process. And so again, everything's gonna be below that shoulder level. The exception might be that we can use a variation of a deep squat pull down. This might not be the first exercise of choice, but it might be something that we can go to because there's a turn that's associated with this. So once we drive something with a, with a reach below shoulder level or a supported activity below shoulder level, we may be able to access a higher level of flexion without any symptoms whatsoever. And especially in this deep squat where we're gonna get some of that posterior lower expansion in that position and then we can superimpose a turn. So we're actually gonna use the compensatory strategy that Mihail was talking about to our advantage. And we create that turn and we create a reciprocal expansion as we move one arm through the, the pull down um, at a time. And that's gonna give us the expansion that we want. So there you go. So there's your solution. This is for the Hawkins Kennedy positive test.